Come on, it's Esau. Just stay up there for a little bit. This is the problem. It doesn't look like it's the problem, but it's the problem. The biggest problem that we find in the body of Christ is in the churches of Christ, the local churches. And the biggest problem that we find in the local churches is not the member, it's not sin, it's not worldliness. What it is, is the person that is commanded by his ordained instructions to lead God. The biggest problem that we have are preachers. We have preachers who don't preach. Now, why don't they preach? One of two reasons, either they don't know how to preach or they don't want to preach. The Bible says, Paul says to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. He made it pretty easy. That means all of the time. He says to reprove. That means that you've got to prove some things right, some things wrong. When you find someone in error, he says to rebuke. That means that you've got to correct that person. You've got to come against that person. It's not a very nice thing to do or say sometimes for some people. He says to exhort. That means to encourage. He says to do so with all long suffering and patience and teaching. So to constantly do so, but doing it, doing it with teaching. We've got people like a Travis Green, someone who, and I don't have really anything against a person, but you've got these people who are musicians turned pastors who are ill-equipped because the primary qualification of a pastor is a teacher. It's called pastor teacher. If we go to Ephesians 4.11, notice what it's called. People think this is a five-fold office. This is four offices that are mentioned. And if the person was skilled enough and understood the scriptures, they'd understand that, that this la these last two nouns, pastor or shepherd, teacher, are connected with one definite article. And so that's the role. It's in the title that he must be a teacher. And people like Travis Green, who are normally custom to entertaining, this is what they do in their churches. They want to entertain you. The story is about Jonah's outdated expectation that needed a fresh breath from God and needed to be reset. The problem is that God desires to reset our expectations because we've been focusing on the wrong thing. You've been focusing on the well. God's trying to shift your focus to your expectation. But well, what's the well? The well is your disappointment. Jonah didn't know God was changing the game. That was not at all what the story of Jonah was about, not about shifting your expectation. He did a little blowing thing because he grew up playing Nintendo, and which is why he's got his little background like games. And he just just recently before he made that statement, blew into an old, I guess, Nintendo cartridge, blew the dust off of it. And so he's trying to make that he's trying to use that analogy in this. That's not the whole. That's not that's not at all even remotely what the story of Jonah is about, about shifting expectations. Not at all. Because we've been focusing on the wrong thing. You've been focusing on the well. God's trying to shift your focus to your expectation. But well, what's the well? The well is your disappointment. Jonah didn't know God was changing the game. He says, you've been focusing on the wrong things. You've been focusing on the well, and the well is disappointment. No, it's not. That That is not the story of Jonah. He, he makes the well out to be more than what it is. The, the well is simply an agent for God to do or to discipline Jonah to bring Jonah where God wanted him to be. It's not about disappointment. And so now he wants to, I think it's, it, it comes across as more of an opportunity to put on your, your show, uh, putting your stage props. I don't have a problem with stage props. Someone's going to say, well, Corey, that's just not your, 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 your style of preaching. It's not you, but it works for others. So why are you saying these things? Well, because what it does is it does not engender the people that are listening to want to grow in the world. We're going to look at the scriptures in a second to see why this is a problem. But when when all you want to do is come to entertain people, to have uh, things remind them of their past or to bring up little Nintendo stuff or his next little thing, they're going to leave one, not even understand the scriptures. And the biggest reason why, why they won't understand the scriptures is because you don't even understand the scriptures. The way he just explained that, that's not at all what the story is about. But I've got to make it fit because I'm, I'm trying to get something across my people that has nothing to do with the scriptures. It has everything to do with me just entertaining these people, but not really giving them anything of substance. Well, my 80s and 90s babies at? And I brought y'all back with the Nintendo. I'm going to bring you back with something else. You ain't seen one of these in 25 years. If you're under the age of 30, you're about to go in a shop. You're not even going to know what this device is. Again, you're taking a passage, twisting the passage. Not even twisting the passage. You're just really distorting the passage. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about because... It's almost as though you want to use the passage to get to the props. It's called. Now, if I fall off this thing, y'all don't put me on. Don't put me on TikTok. Come on, Rondell. 
but jump or something, let me. Why am I on this song? Just stay up there for a little bit. Cause I'm trying to show you something. My name is Disappointment. His name is Expectation. And the height of your expectation controls the depth of your disappointment. You've been focusing on disappointment. They want to give you these little platitudes, these little nice little pithy statements that have nothing to do with the scriptures. Again, Jonah is not about him being disappointed. That is not the point at all. We've got one of the few times we've got three prophets who are prophesying to the nations, to non-Jews. That's what Jonah's doing. And God is in there. He can't even pull that out. It's not a difficult story to go to. As a matter of fact, we see the same thing, the, the same imagery being brought up by Jesus because Jesus brings us up. We have pastors who don't know how to preach, who don't want to preach, or even both. And the problem is there are people in the pulpit who suffer. Instead, what they would rather do is come and bring little trinkets to the stage or props or do a little different theatrics, things like that to make you feel like you've gotten something, as Paul says, to tickle your ears, to make you think that you've gotten something to happen because they itched them, they scratched them an itch, and you felt entertained, but you were not edified. You may have felt edified, but rather than being edified, you were entertained. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, this is interesting. In the verse before that, in verse 16, he says, I created the blacksmiths. So, so God says, the people forming the weapon, I actually made them. And he's claiming sovereignty here. What he's saying is, even those who are gifted to create things against you, I have enabled them to be able to do that. Which means, the people who I've given the gift to, I can also give limitations to. It's just, you just want to just put on something, just do something. Now, this is one of those passages that people bring up to say, to use for us. And this clearly in Isaiah 54 is not about us, it's about Israel what God is going to do. And this is later. It's not happening now. It's not happening to anyone. There's never been a person right now that has had no weapon that has ever been formed against them. But God is saying that this is going to happen to them later where no weapon formed against them will prosper. I get people want to want to use that for us to make us feel good. Nothing formed against them is going to prosper. Uh, no mouth that's raised against me. Shall. No, that passage is not for us. Now we can learn from it, but it's not for us. But let's see where he's going with this. But this is revelation God gave me that I got to drop with you and we're out of here. You ready for this? He says, this is a promise for the weapon formed against you. 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 What y'all doing? What y'all doing? Can I make a weapon? Let me, let me help. When the bulk of what you're doing, when the whole emphasis is on the props and getting these little sensationalized messages across versus the word, then you know you are not doing what you're supposed to do as a preacher. God said no weapon formed against you will prosper, but he didn't say no weapon formed by you won't prosper. If the enemy is going to get you to fail, he knows that his strategy is limited. And so none of what he said is found in scripture, but who cares? Who cares as long as you entertain the people? You've got people there who simply want to see something. They come to see something. As a matter of fact, just like the person who he's a protege of or uh, friends with, Mike Todd, they like to entertain. They like to put stage props on. The people are entertained. Uh, they come. There's some nice sounding music, no question about it. And so their senses are touched, but their heart isn't, their mind isn't. And then Paul, Peter makes this statement, and we just don't see this nowadays as often as we should. There are preachers that do so, but there are many more, more and more who don't. He says that like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. That is if, if, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. We don't have people that have tasted the word and desired like babies desire milk. The problem is we don't have people that have instilled a hunger and desire for the word of God. They have not instilled a hunger and desire in the pews by people in the pulpit. There's no wonder why these people don't want the word of God because you're not feeding them the word of God. Instead, you are feeding them props. You're feeding them acrobatic circuses. You're feeding them all sorts of things for them to kind of be mesmerized on stage to get their attention off of what they should be on, which is the word of God. Listen to this rebuke by the writer of Hebrews. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come need, uh, you have come to need milk and not solid food. You cannot, it's hard for people like them if someone were to go to them and to do an expository preaching and go to the scriptures. 
Lord forbid if you were to give them Hebrew or Greek, they would have no idea what to do with it. Why? Because they're used to nursery rhymes. They're, lo- they're used to Nintendo. They're used to um, seesaws on stage. They're not used to the word of God. And so for everyone who, who, who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. You've got one immature preacher feeding a bunch of infants milk. Maybe they are Christians. I'm not saying that no one is saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you should desire the weightier things, the more mature things. Mature people eat solid food. The Bible says, verse 14, but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good from evil. They have been trained to discern, but not in these places. They stay in an elementary place. And so they desire the elementary things. They keep, they continue to watch cartoons. They continue to stay on, I don't know, the, the childish things. And so what do they want? More of the same thing. And so let's be clear. This is not an issue of preference. Those that will come back and say, well, Corey, it's just not your style. No, it's not God's style. We don't see these sort of things in the Bible because they're not good for us. When you were a child, that might have been good. But at some point in time, it's time to grow up. If you can't sit still and listen to the word of God and enjoy the word of God, it's because you don't love the word of God. And we've got pastors, we've got preachers who placate to that. We've got preachers who want to create a place, a biblical safe space. Yeah, a place where it's safe to not be bombarded with the Bible. We'll give you a little bit, but we'll spend more time with theatrics. We'll spend more time with entertainment. We'll spend more time with little colorful, cliche-ish sort of uh platitudes, and then send you home, give you some nice sounding music, make you move, make you sweat, maybe even make you cry. Think about your problems a little less and even the Bible even lesser. And then we'll come back next week and do the same thing. And so I concur with our brother Lawson in this statement. Give us some men who know the truth. And who will declare the truth. And who will stand with Athanasius and Polycarp and Calvin and Luther and Whitfield and Edwards and who will declare from the housetops that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. <laughs>